Well, good morning, Loft. I'm so glad to be worshiping with you this morning, and I'm glad you are here. Now, I know some of y'all are walking around all high and mighty, bragging about you got another hour of sleep today, okay? Well, some of us did not because our little one-year-old at home did not get the memo that we were all supposed to sleep in. Yes, Rob, hear the tiniest little violin, the saddest, tiniest violin playing here on the stage. (laughs) Well, I'm glad you're here in worship with us. We are in our series, This Is How We Know, and we are reading through the book of 1 John together. I hope you've been reading along on our social media channels. We have been posting uh, the reading assignments each Friday on Instagram and Facebook. So I'm going to ask. Who read this week? All the Hermione Grangers in the house, raise their hand. There's not enough Hermione Grangers in the house. Okay, so you know where the reading assignment is. Each week on Friday, we will post at Loft Church um, on our Instagram and Facebook so you can read along. And this week, I hope you did read along. Usually I would tell you, just pull out your cell phone right now and you could read it. It's so easy. But this week is a huge chunk of scripture, right? We only have seven weeks to move through this book, and so we're making some good ground here today. Rob had the same challenge last week, moved through a lot of ground last week. And um, this week, we are resting in chapter 3, verses 11 through 23. Though the reading assignment goes before and after that, we're going to kind of camp out in that scripture. And I want to set this up for us, for those of you who may be new or or who are just joining us. The book of 1 John is a letter from the Apostle John to a Christian community. And these folks are relatively new in their walk to faith. And so he is writing to them. And he's telling them basically the foundation of the Christian life. This is what it means to be Christian. This is how we live. This is how we respond to the love of Christ that is poured out for us. And so John is uh, actually teaching and responding to uh, kind of a teaching that was popular in that day called Gnosticism. And the Gnostics, you know, Rob talked about the false teachers uh, last week, and the Gnostics were actually teaching that they had a special knowledge that would um, equate to salvation. So they had a special knowledge about Jesus Christ that would save them. And John is saying... No, nothing will save you except the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's nothing you can go out and do that will save you. There is no knowledge great enough that you can go out and find and get for yourself that will save you. What we have seen and what we have heard, this is the Apostle John speaking, is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that's the only thing that will save you. And so that's kind of uh, the the setup for this passage. Um, Let's read this together. You'll hear a word, a very specific word, that is echoed quite a bit in this passage, so be listening for it. Chapter 3, verse 11, it'll be on the screens for you. John writes, for this is the message you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Right? There's no knowledge. There's no new knowledge. From the very, very beginning, this message is that we should love one another. We must not be like Cain, who was from the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be astonished, brothers and sisters, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. Whoever does not love abides in death. All who hate a brother or sister are murderers, and you know that murderers do not have eternal life within them. We know love by this. This is the namesake verse for our our series here. We know love by this that he laid his life down for us and we ought to lay our lives down for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this, we will know that we are from the truth, and we will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. 
Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what he pleases. And this is his commandment. He's repeating himself here. This is what we heard at the beginning of the passage. And this is Jesus' commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given us. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm getting all traditional. I feel like the word of God for the people of God. Did you see that deep lunge? I've been working out. I've been working out. Get it. Anyway, that was, did you hear that canting? That was real traditional. Thanks be to God. Didn't know I had it like that. Now, did you hear the word that was repeated in this text a lot? Love. You were listening. Rob's been listening. Heard it a few times now. Love. Now, the concept of love, y'all, this is a huge concept. This is a big old concept. I mean, it is difficult to define Researchers actually say it's difficult to study love because you have to define it. And so if we asked all of you to give us a definition of love, we'd have as many definitions as there are people in this room. It's kind of this, this giant concept that's hard to put your finger on. I mean, we could, we, we use the word love for like, oh, I love your shoes, right? Something you really like. There's some strong shoe game here in the front row. I see you. I really do love all of your shoes. Um, size six and a half, if you ever want to get rid of you know who your friend is. Um, but we would say it like if we really, really like something. We use the word love. I can't tell you how many emails I've started out by saying, I'd love to invite you to this, right? Or I'd love to see this happen, you know? We, we pepper our speech with it. Um, we could use it as like having affection for something. Like I would say, I love my cat which would be a lie because I hate my cat. <laughs> I love someone who loves the cat, and that's the only reason I have not turned that cat out to pasture. <laughs> okay, she keeps us up at night more than the baby does, and I ain't having that. I don't know what we're going to do. Pray for the manual household. So we would say, I love my cat. I love my family members, there's familial love, and then there's romantic love that we reserve for our significant other, right, for our loved ones. Greek has three words that describe love that give different nuances. English just has the one, and Greek is the original language for the New Testament that this letter was originally delivered in. And so um, looking at the Greek is very helpful. Greek has eros, which would be romantic love. There's phileo, which is like brotherly love, right? Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. And then there is this love that's used here over and over and over again. This love is agape love. And this is a very unique, special love that is used by Jesus to command us to love one another and it's used to describe the work of Jesus in his life, his death, and his resurrection. This love is a pouring out of oneself. This love is a generous love. This love is the love that sacrifices self and is giving. This is a powerful love that looks different than any other type. And Jesus, actually, this is the word that's on Jesus' lips, agape, in his last request here on earth. He just instated the Lord's Supper. He just uh, foretold of his betrayal. This is in the Gospel of John, the same author. And he says, y'all, I'm, I'm not going to be with you much longer. In John 13, he says, uh, little children, I'm only with you for a little bit longer You'll look at me, and just as I said to the Jews, you can't go where I'm going. But I give you a new commandment, that you should love one another. You should agape one another. You should pour yourselves out for one another, just as I have loved you. 
just as I have poured myself out for you. And by this, everyone will know that you belong to me. By this love, this special love that you show to one another, everyone will know that you are my followers, that you are my disciples. So this love is unique. It's not just like any other love. And this love was shown to me in an extravagant way at a time in my life that was really scary. Um, I was a newly married woman to my husband, Quentin. We hadn't been married maybe a year and a half. And imagine a young Quentin Manuel and a young Michelle Manuel. We lie our heads down to sleep at night and drift off into our dreams. And about an hour later, Quentin rolls over and says, I'm dying. My stomach hurts. We need to go to the hospital. And I, being so in love with my new husband, roll over and say, can you just try to lay on your side and see if it's gas? <laughs> and he laid there for like half an hour more, and finally he was like, no, we're going to the hospital now. Get up. And so we get in the car. It's midnight at this time, and we drive a few minutes to our regional ER. We lived in a rural place at that time. And, um, and sure enough, can you guess what it was? Appendix. Everybody always guessed appendix, and it was the appendix. Apparently, they do like five appendia, appenda, appendectomies, thank you. Appendectomies like a day, so it's like no big deal. But to me, it was a big deal. I was a new wife. I had never loved anyone like this before. For the first time in my life, something so precious could be taken away from me, right? They said, this is an emergency. You will have to have surgery within four hours. And so you need to get to a hospital because we were just at this little regional ER. And so we get in the car and I'm like, you know, I can barely keep the car in between the lanes. I'm trying to play it cool. Quentin is fine. I mean, he's in pain, but he's fine. And, um, and I'm just like, you know, freaked out. And we get to the hospital and there's all this paperwork and there was a, a nurse who was apparently having a real bad day and was not agapeing me. Um, <laughs> just doing the opposite of that. <laughs> Pouring something else out, not love. And, um, and it, was, uh, it was so scary, y'all. It was so scary. And so I called a friend and she came immediately and she brought this big bag of things and I said, what are you... What are you doing? She said, this is not my first rodeo. This bag was like Mary Poppins. It was so deep. She kept pulling things out. It had um, a fuzzy blanket for me. Quentin was fine in the bed. She had a fuzzy blanket. She brought me her house shoes to wear. She, this is genius, she brought an extension cord with a phone charger on it so Quentin could have his phone in the bed with him. Right? That's an important thing these days. Um, and b magazines and all this. And the most important thing that she brought was Chick-fil-A. Can we just all take a moment to praise the Lord for the ministry of Chick-fil-A, okay? And it was not Sunday. That's the important part. Um, but, and Quentin told me, you have to tell them that, you have to tell the story accurately. The one part he wants me to get right is that he did not get to eat the Chick-fil-A. I got to eat all of the Chick-fil-A. So he wants you to know that. Um, but so he went under the knife, right? And I was just a mess. I just, I saw, you know, my life flashing before me or whatever. I mean, it just, to see him so ill and so pasty white about to go into surgery. And, um, and my friend was there. She didn't say much. She didn't do much. She just sat there with me through the whole surgery, through the whole day. She missed work. She had to call in, but she showed up. This is agape love. This is the love where it is sacrificial. She needed to be a hundred different places, but she wasn't. She was right there with me. This is the love that shows up for people. This is the love that is so costly that it got Christ crucified. This is the love that is so, so good that we are supposed to exhibit to one another. 
I want to tell you a way that I saw this show up in our community this week. Um, you know, we are United Methodists, and we belong to a connectional system, which just is a fancy way to say we are in covenant relationship with other uh, pastors and with other churches. And so one of our other pastors in Mississippi called Rob up this week, um, well, a few weeks ago, and said, hey, I've got a member who is really, really sick. He's at MD Anderson with his mom, and they're alone out there. They don't really have any family out there, and they're really disconnected from our church family being so far away. Would you mind getting somebody out there to visit? And Rob said, well, you know, there, it's like 35 miles down there, but we'll see what we can do. We've, we've got a good team here. And so um, we connected with our caring ministries, and it turns out we have some very skilled and trained lay ministers who work in the med center area, and on their lunch break, they go and do uh, hospital visits for some of our members and our people who need it down there. Um, because it's hard for us pastors to get out there every day. It's like half our day to get out there. So immediately, we sent a lay, a lay leader. And then the next week, Reverend Cliff Ritter was able to get out there. And then the next week, Reverend Joy Johnston was able to get out there. And this week, this pastor called Rob and said, hey, man, if these people lived in your area, they would be members at your church. It is making all the difference in the world for them. They thought they were alone. They thought they were disconnected, and they're not. The body of Christ is right there for them. And so this is the agape love. This is the agape love that shows up for people in their darkest hour. We've talked about how this love is costly. It will cost us time to show this love, time which is a non-renewable resource. If anyone figures out how to actually make more time, let me know. I'd love to know, especially as a new mom, right? But time is this, this thing that it will cost us. It might cost us our reputation. We will look very different, is what the word tells us, than the outside world if we're continually pouring ourselves out for others, if we are showing up for others in big ways. It will cost us resources. Our church knows about that. When people are in crisis, uh, we were able to gather our resources and step into their lives for them. Our um, our Society of St. Stephen's is one of those ways that we do that. We're taking up that special offering today. It's costly, this love, but it's what we're commanded to do. It was Jesus' final instructions to us. Love this way. Agape this way. And they will know you. They will know you by what you're doing. So how do we know what love is? We know because Jesus Christ came in the flesh and he showed us. We know this love because God is love and he's continuing to minister to us here in this space. I would say we know what love is also because we, we commune with one another here in this space. We believe at Loft that life is better together and so I hope that somewhere in your faith walk, at some point in time, somebody showed you agape love. And at Loft, we hope to show one another agape love. So in the spring, our small groups are starting up, and I want you to be forward thinking and be planning on seeing what those small groups are about, maybe joining one, maybe leading one. This is where agape love can show up best because you'll get to know people. You'll get to be in the details of their lives. We can know this agape love because we can show it to one another. So what keeps us from showing up in this way for others? What keeps us from loving this way? Well, the passage alluded to it in the beginning. Don't be surprised when the world hates you. This hate will come at us in many different ways, and it will create a lot of pressure to live outside of our values. This hate will come in and begin to speak lies to us, and we will get scared. 
And so I think one of the biggest obstacles to living out agape love with one another is fear, right? Like the the voice of fear is always going to turn you in on yourself and make you think, okay, I got to worry about me. I got to take care of me and my own, and we got to keep all of our resources here so that we're provided for and we're taken care of. Fear doesn't say be generous. Fear doesn't say pour yourself out and share all these goods. Fear doesn't say cross boundaries that society would not have you cross. Fear says, no, always hustle to make sure you're taken care of. I think fear also says, you're not equipped to love people in this way. It'll be awkward. It'll be weird to like step into someone's life when they're in crisis or just to love on people in this way. Fear will tell you, you don't know how to do this. You, you won't do it perfectly, right? There is a, a retired Methodist pastor, a very well-respected, revered man in our conference named Jim Moore, and he served in uh, St. Luke's Church in Houston for a long, long time. And he tells this story on himself, um, and it's, it's pretty funny, but it's also kind of sad <laughs> as a new pastor. But... Um, He, in his young days, uh, was doing his clinical pastoral education, which is a fancy word for your interning as a hospital chaplain. And it's required for many people in in their ordination process. And so he would suit up and show up for duty, um, you know, each week at the hospital. He'd stop at the nurse's station and say, is there anyone who needs to uh, have a visit today? Would you recommend anyone that I need to specifically go and pray with. And each day they'd kind of say, eh, there's a, there's a lot of people. I mean, you could, you just find someone. There'd be many people who would welcome you. And, but one day he showed up and the nurses said, oh, pastor, we're so glad you're here. There is an emergency. We don't know what's happening with this woman, but she, her, her body is just failing her. There's no physiological reason why she's dying but she is, and it just seems like she's given up. It just seems like she has shut down and is letting go. And so he was kind of shaken by this, being a young pastor, someone who'd never stepped into this situation before. And so he starts to walk down the hall toward her room, and he gets to the door, and, um, and you know, in seminary, they don't train you to like step into this stuff. It'd be a good idea, but they train you in a lot more, like theology and all this. But they don't tell you how to step into people's lives specifically in this way. So he went in this room just how you would walk into this room. He got to the door, he fumbled with the latch, the handle, and it swung open so forcefully, it slammed against the wall and it startled the woman in there and it startled him and he, he mumbled some things and he shuffled across the room and, and tried to sit down next to her bed. He pulls up the chair, falls in the floor, completely in the floor, right? And scoops himself up, sits in the chair, um, mumbles out a quick prayer and gets the heck out of there. And he's so embarrassed and leaves thinking, well, that probably didn't do any good. <laughs> and the next week, he shows up for his CPE and the nurses say, Reverend Moore, we're so glad you're here. A miracle has happened. And he says, excuse me? And they said, you know, Miss So-and-so in room 212 down there, the one you visited last week, you've got to go see. She is being discharged today. She's up, she's packing, she's ready to go. She speaks to us. She's eating her food. It's, it's a miracle. It's like something changed overnight for her. And so he, again, thinks, wow, how strange, and he walks down the hall, gets to her room. The door is open. The curtains are open. The sun is shining. She's dressed. She indeed is packing her things and preparing to go home. And he says, ma'am, I don't know if you remember me. Um, And she says, of course I remember you. You're the man who saved my life. And he says, excuse me? She said, you know, when you first visited me, I was in such a dark place. I had given up on life. People in my life had left and had died. I had nothing else to really live for. And I just decided I didn't want to live anymore. 
And so I started, started to shut down. I stopped eating, I stopped speaking, I stopped feeling. But when you came in that day, I mean, you were so awkward and so terrible at what you were doing, but I could see that you wanted to help me really badly. And, and, um, and for the first time in years, I felt compassion and pity. <laughs> And something awakened in me, and it all turned around from there. This is agape love, y'all. This is the agape love that shows up for people. We don't have to get it right. We don't have to get it perfect. We don't even have to do it well. We just have to show up. That's the love of Christ, pouring out of oneself. And so this scripture speaks to fear directly at the end of the passage. It speaks to that hate and the pressure that the world would put in us and tell us that we're not good enough, that we don't have what it takes to be um, agape lovers. Um, It says here toward the end, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Hear that again. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. This agape love is what our Father in heaven is made of. This is what his very substance is. This is his character. And so time and and money and all of those, those may be finite resources. But this love is not finite because God is not finite. So we have a source that we can draw from this love and pour it out so generously to everyone we encounter. We will be known by this world by the way we love one another. We will be known how we agape one another, how we sacrifice ourselves for one another as we begin to prepare our hearts to step to the communion table, to the love feast, I wonder if you'd be willing to pray with me. Gracious and loving God, we do love you, and we thank you that you are teaching us the ways of generous love, the ways of agape love. God, I pray that even now in this moment, you would pour out this love on us and that we would experience it afresh in this place. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.